By definition, temptation is only temptation because if I could get away with it, if it didn't matter, if nobody minded, if God wasn't interested, I could do it. And I would do it, wouldn't you? Because the corruption of our own heart responds to that. And it is our own selves that is the fundamental problem we deal with. Most sin is an inside job. It comes from within our own hearts. In the book of Romans, Paul reveals the relationship between human and godly righteousness. While it's important to understand the teachings inside the pages of Romans, it's life-saving to put them into practice. Today's message is called, The Three Spiritual Laws. If you have a Bible with you, I'm going to read from Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Paul writes, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. What I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, 
but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. What I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. What the law was powerless to do and that was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. You ever wondered why you behave as you do? <laughs> Let me read you what Paul wrote in verse 15 of Romans 7. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And then in verse 19, for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. In other words, what Paul is saying there is this, there are things in life that are good and they're right and I want to do them, but I don't. And there are things in life that are bad and they're wrong and I know they're wrong and I don't want to do them, but you never guess what happens. I do. It's a problem you've got. It's a problem I've got. It's a problem Paul talks about. And Paul explains this dilemma, which we'll look at this morning, by the interplay of three spiritual laws that he describes in Romans chapter 7. There is, first of all, the law of God, and in Romans 7, he talks a lot about this. We talked about this last week. So in verse 7, he says, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. I would not have known what coveting was if the law had not said, do not covet. This is the moral law of God given to Moses, you remember, on Mount Sinai. And it is good, for in verse 12, it says the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. So there is the law of God, which he refers to a number of times in this section. But the second law is what he calls the law of sin. Because in verse 22, he says, In my inner being, I delight in God's law. That is the law of God. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. This is the second spiritual law he talks about. And it is the enemy of the moral law of God. It's called the law of sin, operating, says Paul, in my Flesh is the literal word Paul uses, meaning in my natural self. Waging war, he says there in verse 20, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin. And then there's a third law, which is the remedy to that second law. He calls it the law of the spirit of life. And so in chapter 8 and verse 2, he says, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. 
And this third spiritual law is something which counteracts this law of sin. And it's the law of the spirit of life, he says, in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to talk about the interplay of these three laws as Paul talks about them here in these verses. There is the law of God which reveals the moral character of God. There is the law of sin which resists the moral character of God. And there is the law of the spirit of life which restores the moral character of God into people's life and experience. Now, here's the dilemma. He sums it up in verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, that is the law of God, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. So the law of God is spiritual. As he says in verse 12, it is holy, it is righteous, and it is good. So Paul says, the logical, natural desire that I have in my heart is that in recognizing it to be good and right, I want it. I want to live according to it. As he says in verse 22, in my inner being, I delight in God's law. I'm not struggling with the righteousness of the law of God, but my problem is, verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And I find myself caught up in this dilemma, this conflict of intention and experience that goes on within my life. Now, I want you to notice a very important thing that Paul says here in verse 16 and 17. He says, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is, listen to this, no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Well, that sounds like a convenient excuse, doesn't it? It's no longer I who do it. Look at verse 20, he says it again. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. That's a very convenient cop-out. Well, I've done the wrong thing, but it wasn't me. It was this thing called sin in me that did it. I'm, I'm neutral about this. I mean, if you and I got in a conversation at the end of this service, and suddenly I pull back my arm, clench my fist, and I thumped you in the nose, and then say, oh, so, sorry, but I didn't do that. That, that wasn't me who did that. It was sin living in me who did that. Would you accept that? Especially if we continue the conversation, I did it again. You probably say, listen, chum, there's a bit of sin in me too. Pow, and you probably <laughs> thumped me back. The end of uh, the first service this morning, Young guy, he's about 15, I think. He's a Taekwondo black belt. He came to me with his dad, and he said, that wasn't a very good punch you were throwing there. <laughs> and his dad said, he knows. He's a black belt in Taekwondo. So I said, well, show me a good punch. Show it me on your dad. I'll just show me. <laughs> <laughs> and he wouldn't do so. So I don't know what a good punch is. But would you accept that as, as, as an excuse? Well, it wasn't me who did that. It was, I mean, you imagine driving down the freeway, 120 kilometers an hour, police pulls you up and say, you were driving, you were breaking. Oh, it wasn't me. No, it wasn't me. No, no, no. It was, it was something inside me, sin in me. It wasn't me. Don't blame me. I'm neutral about this. What does Paul mean? What does he mean when he says, it's not I who do it, but sin living in me? What he's talking about there is not my actions, but he's talking about a principle that is bigger than my ability to control it. It's what he says in verse 21 to 23. 
I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. From my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. There is what he calls this law of sin at work within me. And he describes it as being a bit like what I would call, describe it as at least, or illustrated by, as the law of gravity. If I hold this uh, glasses case in the air and let it go, it's going to go down because there's a pull in the earth called the law of gravity that says if something goes up, it's coming down. Now, I can do nothing about that. If I were to walk off the top of a building and you say, why are you lying crumpled in a heap on the floor here? I say, well, it wasn't me. It was the law of gravity that pulled me down here. Paul is saying there is something at work in me, in my natural self, which is what lies behind this word, the flesh or the NIV, uses a term sinful nature, which they've really imported, but it's okay. Um, it's not a term everybody is happy with, but the flesh, the natural, all that I am in myself apart from God, just my natural self, is subject to this law of sin. When I was a kid, my parents taught me that things that are good and things that are bad do what's good. I went to school, my teacher took the same process. He said that things that are right and things that are wrong do what's right, don't do what's wrong, don't tie the girl's hair in front of you to her chair, that's wrong. All the teaching I had was do what's good, do what's right, but it was always more interesting and easier and certainly more fun to do what was wrong. Why? Because I have this nature that is subject to a law of sin, Paul says, that is at work within my members. So he says, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body. The law I delight in reveals the character of God. He's writing here as a Christian. The law reveals the character of God, but this law of sin resists, resists the character of God. And hence this duality, this civil war that we experience within our own hearts, within our own souls. And this is the nature of our fallen humanity. It's not just that something happened in history but something happened that leaves me in a position now where I'm subject to a broken, fallen nature, where left to myself, the natural pull is down. Now, if you don't believe that, you'll be tempted to refine yourself, improve yourself, hoping that your own resolution to make your life different will be sufficient. You may make promises to God about how good you're going to be starting from today. But despite the greatest intentions, you will fail if that is the basis on which you want to change. And you may become disillusioned with yourself, but God is never disillusioned with us for one simple reason. He doesn't suffer from any illusions in the first place. He knows exactly the state and corruption of the human heart. You know, be very careful of blaming the devil for your sin. The devil, of course, is active, is at its root and source behind the fall. But as James writes in James chapter 1, verse 14, each one is tempted when by his own desire he is dragged away and enticed. He says, your problem is your own desire. And temptation by definition, and I've said this before, temptation by definition is attractive, otherwise it wouldn't be temptation. It appeals to something in us. I'm never tempted to walk in front of a moving truck. It's not attractive to me. I am tempted sometimes to push somebody else in front of a moving truck, <laughs> depending who it is. <laughs> by definition, temptation is only temptation because if I could get away with it, if it didn't matter, if nobody minded, if God wasn't interested, I could do it, and I would do it, wouldn't you? By definition. Because the corruption of our own heart responds to that. And it is our own selves that is the fundamental problem we deal with. Most sin is an inside 
job. It comes from within our own hearts. I had a friend in England who went to speak at a church in the south of England on one occasion. At the end of the meeting, a lady came to talk to him, asked him if he would pray for her. And he said, certainly, what is your need? And she said, I'm troubled with demons. He said, tell me more. She said, I have a demon of greed. I have a demon of pride. I have a demon of lies. I have a demon of lust. I have a demon of envy. Demon of this, demon of that. My friend said to her, you mean to tell me you have a demon of greed? She said, yes, and a demon of pride, and a demon of lies, and a demon of lust, and a demon of envy, and a demon of this, and a demon of that. And she said, yes. He said, that is remarkable. She said, why? He said, because I can do all those things all by myself. I don't have a single demon. Every one of those problems is my problem too. He said, madam, your need is not exorcism. Your need is repentance. And one of the leaders of that church who told me about that said she had gone to every visiting preacher with the same story. He was the only one who talked sense to her. That doesn't mean they're not demons who are active. But you know something? If you look at all the references to demon possession in the New Testament, which are in the four Gospels in the book of Acts, and there are 32 occasions of demonization, and I've looked at all of them, and demons are credited with all kinds of physical powers. But they're never credited with moral powers. So for instance, a demon in the Gospels makes a man blind, can give unusual strength, suddenly can snap some chains with which he's been tied, it can give a man convulsions. It can throw a man to the ground. It can cause a man to act as though he's insane. They can drive pigs into the sea. They can predict the future. But nobody ever sinned because of a demon. No one ever committed adultery in the New Testament because of a demon. Do you know why people commit adultery? I'll tell you why. Because they want to. They want to. And as long as we say, no, 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 no I'm, and this is out of control, we're kidding ourselves. Why do they want to? Because what is corrupt within that person is the nature which they've inherited, the flesh which fights against the law of God in the first instance, as he writes about it here. And sin comes from within. That does not mean there's not such a thing as demonization or the demons not active. They are. But if we take our understanding of them from the New Testament, they're never credited with moral power, forcing somebody to do something that is wrong. It's physical powers they're credited with. Now, this is very encouraging stuff, isn't it? Eh? You know, you came here this morning wanting to be encouraged, and we've been rubbing our noses in the muck. <laughs> but it's important we understand this, because as I've said on a number of occasions, we have to have a proper diagnosis if we're going to understand a proper remedy to anything. And Paul is clear to give this diagnosis of the corruption of the human heart, but there's something else which is equally true for a person who is a Christian. That when a person becomes a Christian, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live within them. In Romans 8 and verse 9, a couple of verses after I stop reading, and we'll come to this section on another occasion, he says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Because what makes a person a Christian is that the Spirit of Christ comes to live within them. It's not that you receive the Holy Spirit when you become a Christian. It's the other way around. You become a Christian when you receive the Holy Spirit. He is the one who makes you a Christian. 
Forgiveness, getting rid of our sin is part of the process, but that is not the purpose. We get rid of our sin, not just to have the benefit of a clean conscience, but that we might then be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes to live within us, he is the opposite of everything we are by nature. And he brings with him appetites for that which is right, a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. He brings with him new ability. God works in us, Scripture says, to will and to act according to his good pleasure. And so you have what Paul describes in Romans 8 and verse 2, this new law. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life sets me free. He says, from the law of sin. There is this spirit of life, and some translations probably more accurately say the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, because it is the life of God imparted to us, sets us free, counters the law of sin and death. That is the natural pull that we are subject to. You see, your life and my life require intervention. We do not have within ourselves sufficient resources to live the way we're designed to live. Resolution is not enough. Determination is not enough. Dedication is not enough. There has to be something outside of ourselves that counters this inner law, this law of sin and death. And in Romans 7, Paul is describing what it's like to live by your own resources. In those verses, he's saying, let me just tell you what it's like left to me, left to myself, with, notice in those verses, no God, no Jesus Christ, no Holy Spirit. Just me. And I find I have the desires and the appetites for what is right, but I cannot do them. Because this law at work within me is a law that is as impossible to break as is impossible for me to simply run and leap and break the law of gravity. And then he comes to that conclusion in verse 24, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me? Now notice this question. He doesn't say, what a wretched man I am, what will rescue me? Is there a technique I can employ? Is there a method I can follow? Is there a program I can go through? Is there an experience I can have? All of these are made available to us. They all have to be updated every few years because none of them work. The question is, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me? And he answers his own question, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He says, this is too big for me. Somebody else has got to do it. And then three verses later, in Romans 8, verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. What a wretched man I am. I have no hope in myself. How am I going to be set free? Who is going to rescue me? Yes, there is an answer, it's Jesus Christ, the Lord, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There's something about Jesus Christ that is not in itself the object of my belief, but it is the subject of my experience. The life of Jesus Christ sets me free. Paul writes here, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin. I'm convinced Paul was sitting in an airplane when he wrote that verse. And what he's saying here is this, that it's not something or somehow. It has to be someone, and it is the spirit of Jesus Christ in me who is the counteracting law that not only counteracts that law of sin, but is stronger than and sets me free from the law of sin. It's not a case of destroying the law of sin any more than an aircraft destroys the law of gravity. When an aircraft takes off, gravity doesn't say, oh, that's another one got away, forget about it. Do you know something? Every moment that aircraft is in the air, crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the law of gravity remains totally committed to smashing that aircraft to the ground. If it lost a wing, that's exactly what it would do. 
In your life and mine, the law of sin is totally committed to smashing you to the ground. It is a battle that continues. And the old nature is not destroyed. As Paul said to the Galatians, the spirit fights against the flesh, and the flesh fights against the spirit to keep you from doing what you would. And that is a relentless, constant, daily battle. Now, when I fly the Atlantic, not for one moment am I able to fly. I don't sit there and say, wow, I'm really doing well here. I'm not even flapping anything. No, I'm not able to fly. I, I am being flown. You know, don't ask God to give you strength. The Bible never talks in those terms. What the scripture says is the Lord is my strength. That's quite a different thing. If I go to Toronto Airport and say, would you give me the ability to fly to England? They'd look at me as though I was strange. They'd say, we cannot give you the ability to fly anywhere. But what we can do is we can fly you. If you will be in the plane, you'll enter into our aircraft what is true of the aircraft will become true of you. Because in the aircraft, we will fly you. We can't give you the ability to fly. It's not, here's the ability to live the Christian life. You cannot live it outside of that union with Christ, that active fellowship, relationship, development of that with Christ. And so scripture says a number of times, I've written down a number of references, which I won't read you, but the Lord is my strength and my song. Oh Lord, be our strength, everyone. The sovereign Lord is my strength. You've got many verses like that in scripture. But this doesn't mean that we become passive. Every illustration, of course, is inadequate. If we think, well, just sit in the seat of an aircraft and put your seatbelt on, fold your arms, read a book, whatever you want to do, go to sleep. And that's how it works. The principle is that there's a law more powerful than the law of sin which sets us free. It's the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. But it is not automatic on our part because Paul goes on to say in verse 3 of chapter 8, for what the law, that's the law of God, was powerless to do and it was weakened by the simple nature because this law of sin was all the time working against it. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering and so he condemned sin in sinful man in order, listen to this, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us Requirements alone will be fully met. Who do not live according to the simple nature, but according to the Spirit? Now then he says, the requirements of the law might be met in you. You can live this life if you do not live according to the simple nature, but if you live according to the Spirit. Well, that begs the question, how do you live according to the Spirit, and how do you not live according to the simple nature? Well, he tells us in the next verse, verse 5. Those who live according to the simple nature have their minds set on what their nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Now notice there the place of the mind. In fact, that is the criteria. There's some who live according to the flesh. Who are they? Their minds are set on the things of the flesh. There are those who live according to the Spirit. Who are they? Their minds are set on the things of the Spirit. The place of the mind is crucial in the book of Romans. You'll find that if you look carefully for that as you go through. Don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know? He'll say several times. Your mind is crucial to this. And you'll know, and I've said this several times, that the word repent, the English word repent comes from the Greek word metanoia, which is a combination of two words. Meta to change, noia, the mind. 
The word repent literally means to change the mind. It's not something we feel, a bad feeling about ourselves or our sin. That can go nowhere if that's all it is. It's not something we do. Repentance is something we think. We change our minds about ourselves, about our sin, about God. It is the act of repentance whereby we become a Christian, but it is the attitude of repentance whereby we be the Christian we have become. And he is saying here that it is your mind set on the things of God. The role of the mind is crucial. That doesn't mean it's merely a psychological process. It is a spiritual process. But part of that spiritual process is your mind intentionally set on the things of God. So in Romans 12, verse 2, later on, Paul says, be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Now, he's not contradicting everything he said about being renewed by the work of Christ in you, for you, on your behalf in the cross, back in the early parts of Romans, or he's not canceling out the work of the Holy Spirit. It's in the light of all of that, he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is, that your mind must become occupied with the things of God. I have no doubt the real battle in all our lives is a battle of the mind. And let me say it again, you simply cannot live the Christian life with a closed Bible, where your mind is not being instructed and renewed and enriched through the Word of God. David asks the question in the Old Testament, how does a young man keep his way pure? Good question. Answers it by guarding it according to your word. No, he's not saying, oh, you don't need the Holy Spirit, just the word, of course. All these things must be put together. These are all pieces of the puzzle. And he says in that same psalm, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And by the way, not hid in my head. It's not just information in my heart. It becomes part of me. Why? That I might not sin. How does the law of the spirit of life in Christ set us free? It is the active presence of the Holy Spirit, but those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on the things of the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds on the things of the flesh. Your mind has to be put on the things of the spirit. It is intentional and deliberate. You cannot drift in the Christian life and assume it's going to work. Of course it's not going to work. Of course it's not. You can't drift in your marriage. That intentionally building, developing, fellowshipping, communion with each other. Neither can you in the Christian life. Let me ask you two questions. Is it possible for a Christian to commit adultery? The answer is yes. Second question, is it right for a Christian to commit adultery? The answer is no. So how does what is not right become possible to a Christian? Well, he tells us in Romans 8, verse 5, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what their nature desires. You allow your mind to play around with things that you never actually intend to do, and you will wake up one day to an awful shock that as a man thinks, so is he. That's a verse from Proverbs. There's a saying, you're not what you think you are, but what you think you are. It's not a psychological process. It's a spiritual process. But the mind is a crucial part of that, as is the heart, as is the will. Let me ask you another question. Is it possible for a Christian to be covetous, to be greedy? The answer is yes. Is it right for a Christian to be covetous and greedy? The answer is no. So how does a Christian who knows what is right do what is right? Well, 8 verse 5 tells us, those who live according to the Spirit have their mind set on what that Spirit desires. So the person who recognizes that covetousness and greed is wrong, it is not the will of God for me, their mind is on what the Spirit desires, and so they live in accordance with the Spirit. 
You know, flying in an aircraft and experiencing the law of aerodynamics, setting you free from the law of gravity, does not come about just by believing it. You might hear the theory, aircraft fly. And the reason why they fly is that their lift becomes greater than their weight and their thrust becomes greater than the drag. Those are the basic principles behind the law of aerodynamics. And you might believe it, explain it. Watch fl aircraft flying through the sky. But you don't fly just by believing it any more than you live the Christian life just by believing it. You can sit on your backside and believe everything correctly and never experience it. Flying in an aircraft, experiencing the law of aerodynamics, setting us free from the law of gravity, requires that you set your mind in what that aircraft can do. You find out the timetable of the airline. You go and purchase your ticket. You go deliberately out to the airport with enough time to catch the flight. You check in. You get onto the aircraft. You sit down. You put on your seatbelt. You set your mind on the process that puts you in the right relationship with the aircraft, that the aircraft, when it flies, it flies you. And we want far too much passivity in the Christian life. We just want it to happen. And it doesn't just happen. Paul is very clear in Romans, as we've been looking through it, that there are things we must understand, the intricacies of why it is I don't live as I live and what this old nature is and why it's pulling me down and what the possibility is being set free. But don't finish Romans 8, verse 2, the Spirit sets me free from the law of sin. Go on to these next verses. They're those who live according to the flesh. What's wrong? Are they Christians? Yes, they're Christians. What's wrong? Their mind is on the things of the flesh. What about those living upon the Spirit? Their mind's on the things of the Spirit. And that's intentional on your part. We live in a world, of course, that is littered with everything but the things of the Spirit. We're bombarded every day. Television, advertising, radio, the general tenor of the world around us. If we have an enemy outside, which is the devil, an enemy inside, which is the flesh, we have another enemy, the world. The world, the flesh, and the devil are the three enemies the book of James identifies for us. And we've got to set ourselves apart from all this stream of the world that we're, we're all in, we're all swimming in it. We have to, to live our lives. This is the environment that we're in. But we're foolish if we don't guard our minds, and guard our hearts and set our minds on those things that are of the Spirit, those things which are of God. That's why spending time in the Word of God and obeying what it says and believing what He promises, the spiritual process, it involves the mind, involves the heart, involves the will. And we will look at that on another occasion because he also talks about the fact that there are things later in Romans 8 that we have to put to death. You've got to hit them on the head. And you've got to do that. And we'll come back to that process next week. The flesh, the old nature, is the theme of Romans 7. And Paul didn't put the chapter divisions, but they are conveniently divided because the flesh, the old nature, and the futility of it is the theme of chapter 7. The Holy Spirit and the freedom of the Holy Spirit is the theme of chapter 8. That is the counteracting force. Not the destruction of the law of sin, but the counteracting of it. You know, I've sat in aircraft. We've been through some violent turbulence. I was served a cup of coffee, the last flight I was on, actually. And the coffee was brought to me just as we hit some turbulence. And I watched that coffee spinning around in my cup until there was actually nothing left in the cup. I didn't drink any of it because it would have gone all over me. But it went everywhere else. I mean, it's violent turbulence, and the, the thing's bouncing along. And, and you sit there, and you wonder, is this thing going to bounce back up sometimes when, it, when it's bouncing like that? And uh, you'll experience that in the Christian life, the pull of sin, the pull of temptation and the law of sin, there's a violent turbulence. Sometimes you go through a day of really violent turbulence, and sometimes you, you drop about a mile in the sky, and you feel the thump of it. But as we look to the Spirit of God, 
His commitment is to set us free. Not to perfection. That's not offered to us in this life. But to freedom that is offered us. And freedom is not, it's all gone. But in the battle, and it's an intense battle, unless you give in. The only time it's not intense when you give in. <laughs> when you fight it, it's intense. The freedom is the freedom that you fly. And the Spirit of God sets us free and your mind is engaged and your will is engaged and your heart is engaged and your determination is engaged. Let me finish. There's some of you this morning and you've never received Christ into your life at all. And so some of this is a little bit outside your experience of life. You experience the law of sin, of course, and the battle with it. But you've never been born again of the Holy Spirit. This new life which breeds new appetite, the Spirit of God in you. When the Holy Spirit comes to live within you, there are new appetites. There's a new life. There's a new desire. You can receive him this morning. You can say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me to reconcile me to God. You might place your Holy Spirit in me. I want to receive you into my life. You can do that this morning. And go home, beginning the journey. But next week, we're going to pick this up again. We're going to follow this through. What is involved in my being able to experience this freedom, this liberation of the Spirit of God? Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your word never teases us. It never dangles something in front of us that's out of reach. We see the ultimate perfection that one day we may know in your presence in heaven. We look forward to that. But in this life, you've forewarned us. Clearly, we're in a battle. But in that battle, there is freedom. Freedom to know that though we do battle, though we feel the pressure of the battle, we can experience in Jesus Christ, the liberty. And sometimes getting off the ground is difficult for us because we've been so long pinned to the ground by particular sins and habits and addictions and all kinds of things which do hold us to the ground. But thank you. There is hope. There is hope. And we can find in you freedom. Help us, we pray, not to just want this sentimentally, but help us, we pray, to be committed to the processes of our minds, our hearts, our wills being engaged with you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.